Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. We've got something today that probably most of you never heard of. And it's sort of a shame because it is extremely significant, especially with the fact that the M4 was deemed by several people or many people to be fundamentally flawed and need to be replaced by an external piston rifle. And, you know, the HK416 was there to rescue. However, there was an external piston rifle long, long before the HK416, the LWRC, the POF, long, long before. If we go back to the Vietnam era, uh, 1968 was when the Colt uh, was having the issues with the M16s in Vietnam, and they decided they were going to, uh, is, is more of a preemptive strike, develop an external piston gun in case an army wanted to go that way. Yeah, the Colt 703. Now, as you know, the history tells us that the uh, army fixed the M16, and there was never any need thereafter uh, for an external piston rifle. The next major milestone uh, that most people would expect would have been like the Rhino system of the uh, 1980s, and then we would get into the uh, the onset of the LWRC and then the HK416 and so forth. But around uh, 1965, there was another one, uh, and there's this system here was uh, called the T65 out of Taiwan. Now, uh, Taiwan was probably one of the only countries to ever build uh, the M14 for military use. Uh, they called it the Type 57. Very, very short-lived. I think they only manufactured like 149,000 or so of them. Uh, and they were decommissioned relatively quickly. You know, Taiwanese, Chinese are relatively small people. And, you know, that rifle was just, uh, you know, it, it was gigantic. It was it was heavy, heavy recoil. It was it, it was not uh, it was not a good idea for them whatsoever. So in uh, 1965, uh, the T-65 was produced and didn't go into production until 1976. It was an M-16 type platform. It looked very similar to it until you got inside of it. Now, the rifle that you see here is the T-91. Uh, this is the one that we're going to be talking about, but I'm going to give you some background on where this came about. So in, in uh, 1965, it was developed and it was fielded in 1976. What the rifle was, was based, based on an M16A1 type rifle. However, it had a 20-inch barrel, and it was a 1-in-12-inch in 12 inch twist, because there was no SS-109 or M855 back then. It had a fixed rear sight. There was no carrying handle. It had a fixed rear sight that was adjustable for windage only. It was uh, 39.8 inches long, weighed 7 pounds. The handguards were like a ribbed plastic. Now, a very interesting thing about the... Uh, the manufacturing capabilities of Taiwan at the time, they did not have the ability to do forgings. So basically they had aluminum castings that they manufactured the upper and lower receivers out of. Didn't look very good at all, and they were basically painted over. Uh, so it wasn't the most cosmetically sane rifle. Uh, it was safe semi-fully automatic, and it was a external piston, a short stroke system. So they had decided way back when that they wanted to go with a short stroke piston. They liked the M16's air, air, you know, the ergonomics of it, like the light weight of it. Again, the rifle they chose was seven pounds. Utilized the standard M16 magazine. The stock had sort of a weird uh, curve to it in the bottom. It's sort of been unique to China as well as you know, China's Norinco versions of the M16 as well as the, the Taiwanese. But the next model that came out was the T65K1, which was basically the same rifle, but now they had the technology to be able to uh, have forgings and manufacturing from a much stronger forging instead of the much, much weaker uh, castings. And something else they did that was rather unique with it as well. They used a trigger pack instead of a standard lower receiver where you had the hammer trigger pin, selector pins drilled through the receiver. Basically, it was a drop-in pack, which had the hammer trigger, uh, auto sear, everything in there so that you didn't have to draw out the receivers. Now, that was not uh, for very long. Uh, that was uh, that was changed relatively quickly, but uh, that was part of the T65K1. Another addition to it was, instead of having just a plain plastic hangars, they had a heat shield in there as well, which was certainly necessary because the thing was a safe semi-fully automatic rifle. Next came the T65K2, or which is also known as the T68. This is probably one of the more predominant rifles. In fact, uh, I've seen these rifles over in, um, by use by the Jordanian Army myself. Uh, it was very similar to the to the original T65, but it had some modifications to it. The fixed carrying handle became fully adjustable like the M16A2. It was uh, Obviously, this predated the M16A2, but it was adjustable for uh, elevation and windage. The rifles were manufactured in both 1 in 12 and 1 in 7, because at the time was a switch over to the uh, SS109 or M855 type uh, NATO bolts. So they were able to uh, keep up with that as well and, you know, with their ammunition. The furniture on it was a greenish color instead of a black. Uh, the, the receivers had more of a blackish color to them. The selector lever was safe, semi-auto, and burst. It went all ways. Uh, so you had the ability by uh, manipulating the selector lever to go to safe, semi-auto, or a three-shot burst. 
The handguards were now rounded, and they had a cross-section very similar to that of the M16A2, where you had an interchangeable handguard that went either up or down and didn't make any, any difference. You didn't have to have a left and a right. You had one handguard that would fit both the top and the bottom. And at this time, Taiwan released a new magazine. They released a new magazine, as you can see, has uh, stops on here. Well, that's what those stops do is they prevent over-insertion, which damages the bolt catch. And you can also see they put some, uh, some holes in there so you can you know, see how many rounds were in the top of the magazine. And this magazine is currently in use today. This one stayed in production. The next firearm in that particular family of weapons was a C65K2C. What we had here was a carbine. Now, this was a 14 half inch carbine. It had the same specifications as you saw with the T65K2. Uh, it had a very different telescopic type stock than the uh, standard M16. It was a much larger stock. Um, there was some durability problems with that stock, but uh, you know it was, uh, it was the same size. You had the same size buffer. You had the same size receiver extension. They also had a very uh, unique muzzle system on them as well. It was a combination of both a flash suppressor and a muzzle brake, and it was often timed so when it was firing on fully automatic, it would be able to keep the, the muzzle down by keeping it from rising up and to the right. Now, the T-65 system has seen, has seen service in many countries. I'm going to give you the list here. Uh, Taiwan, Guatemala, El Salvador, Haiti, uh, Liberia, Panama, Honduras, Nicaragua, Lebanon, Costa Rica, and Libya. It had some foreign sales. The rifle was very, very successful. And if you when, you, when we start getting into this rifle, you're going to see a lot of similarities between this rifle and several that came after it. Now, is there a direct linkage? Don't know. I guess you have to look at it and see for yourself. The next iteration would be the T86, uh, which was only from 2000 to 2002. Uh, it was in production for a very, very short period of time. Uh, this was also a carbine. Uh, for the most part, they did have a full-length rifle. The main difference between the uh, T86 and T65 rifles was the T. 86 would accept the T85 grenade launcher. It was a fixed carrying handle as well. It was adjustable for windage and elevation. It was also a safe semi-auto and burst configuration. Length was 31.5 inches retracted and 34.6 inches extended. Only 6.75 pounds. So we are now getting into a very lightweight basic rifle. Again, we're looking back at 2000, 2002. This predated the use of all the optics uh, that we have right now in the flat top upper receivers. Now, these, like the M16s, what you were able to mount an optic on top of the carrying handle if you so chose, but it was less than optimal. So the T86, uh, it saw some service in both uh, Taiwan and Jordan. But there was one major uh, advancement that came on this system. Uh, as you're going to see when we take this handguard off, this has a steel sleeve that encompasses the uh, operating system. Prior to that, the system was open, like most of the ones you see today. Most of the rifles that you see today, if you were to drop the rifle in mud or whatever, that's going to get directly on the operating system, uh, the operating rod, the spring, and, and, and so forth. Not this one. This one has a completely captivated system, so no matter what you throw onto there, the, the whole operating system is, is encased. So I think that was a very significant uh, and reliability enhancement. So now we're looking at what we have here. Now, the rifle we have here is the T91. The T91 was a modified T86, which had several modifications to it. We have a mill standard 1913 rail on top. We see we have a detachable carrying handle. The T91 came with both a detachable carrying handle as well as a just a, a backup sight. You can go either way with it, but you did have a 1913 rail on there. You can mount a T85 grade launcher. Now, the operating system on this one, due to the fact that it has some modifications to the, uh, the system, is not compatible with the T86 or the T68. This also was a safe semi-auto burst. We do have an improved stock that's much more durable than the original one. The gas system was modernized, and the locking lugs themselves were, uh, were decreased by about a millimeter. So again, you have some parts that are different dimensions than the previous. Now we have a barrel length of 15.98 inches, so you have a longer barrel. And again, that longer barrel, what that does give you is it gives you uh, more, more time to burn and also gives more dwell time, so you have a, a little bit better of a system for as far as uh, extracting. Now, this one has had a lot of success. Uh, we're looking at users in Jordan of some 20,000 units, Kuwait, 18,000 units, Taiwan, 240,000 units, Indonesia, 10,000 units, the UAE, 30,000 units, and India, 1,000 units. So this rifle has been very, very successful. This system has been in service since the 70s. It's been reliable. It's been accurate. It's been dependable. And it's been used by many countries throughout, especially the Middle East, not so much uh, outside the Middle East, but mostly within the Middle East. So we have something here that predates the HK416, the POF, the LWRC, uh, everything that you see now. And we're going to start taking this thing apart. You're going to be able to see there's just some really uh, interesting similarities uh, to this versus everything else that's out there. So I think what we're going to do now is we're going to take this thing apart and we'll show you what the parts are. 
Now, this rifle here was a custom build. Uh, this one, I had to put a call out to Michiko, to William Trotter. Uh, he helped me with this because there was, I, we, we both wanted rifles that were exact uh, to what the original ones were. We wanted it so you couldn't tell the difference. And for this one here, with the exception of the fire control group, uh, you would not be able to tell the difference between this and a real T91. Uh, mostly thank you to William. He was able to find all the parts to put them together. Uh, we're also going to talk about Wolf, um, where basically what uh, the upper receiver is on here. With, this one has a heavy modifications. But we're going to take this thing apart and uh, we're going to show you how it works. Well, first thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure she's safe. No brass, no ammo. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove this, the sling. As you can see from here, just a clip. And pull that right off. Like a standard AR-15 M16, we're going to push in the front and rear takedown pins. And we have our lower receiver. As you can see from the lower receiver, it's a three position receiver extension. Uh, the stock, again, is similar, but different from a uh, standard M4 type. They have their own custom receiver extension nut and end plate. As we can see, the markings on here are all written in Chinese. And if we look at the safety, we have safe, semi, burst, and the bottom would be auto. Of course, this is a semi-automatic only, but we have the markings on there to make the receiver look exactly like it's supposed to. You can take a look at the rather unique Taiwanese pistol grip. It does have a compartment in the bottom. Now, when we look at the inside, all the parts in here, with the exception of the hammer and trigger mechanism, are all Taiwanese. Uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit later about where you get all these parts from. Uh, installed in here is an H2 buffer, just due to the fact this is an external piston gun, uh, due to the dynamics of it, uh, it generally requires an H2, especially if you're wanted on fully automatic, but this still stops bolt carrier bounce. And if we look at the safety, you're going to see that we have an arrow on here. There's nothing written on the sides, they never did that, but uh, you, have a, you have one that lets you, at least let you know that you know, you know the up is safe, semi, auto, and burst. Standard uh, trigger guard. So now we're going to get into the, the bolt carrier group. Now, if you look at that bolt carrier group, that is identical, uh, pretty much, to what you see the Colt 6940P. Uh, it's very similar to several that you're going to see in the industry. Uh, it has, obviously, no gas ports in it, uh, which are not necessary. Uh, there's no exhaust ports whatsoever. You can see that the tombstone is part of the bolt carrier. It's all parts, all one piece, as you can see. Now, we're going to take this apart because the bolt's a little bit different as well. As you can see, the frame pin is not chrome plated. It's got some kind of a black finish on it or some kind of a lacquer uh, to keep it from rusting. As you can see from the rear of the bolt, there is no place to here to mount any gas rings. Obviously, gas rings are not needed in an external piston system. Uh, many companies do put gas rings on there just so it's easy to uh, have the bolt stay in the unlocked position for disassembly. Uh, but it's not necessary at all. But other than that, it has a lot of similarities, but it is not compatible with anything else. This is its own bolt. Reassembly is very similar to anything else. I'll we'll make sure your extractor's to the right. We can drop our cam pin right in at its proper orientation. Drop. In like so. Looking at the upper receiver, you can see there is no forward assist. Good things. The ejection port cover is the original uh, AR-15 M16 type, which is not reinforced. So they've kept that all these years. Another interesting aspect is, is how the uh, the hinge pin for the injection port dust cover is held in place. It's held in place by a little point on here rather than having an extra C-clip. So the spring snaps into a little, uh, a little groove mounted onto the injection port cover rod. Now, we have a 1913 rail on here. I'm not taking this off because I've been keeping this with the iron sights uh, because I just happen to like it that way. Uh, and I Loctited these uh, nuts on here due to the fact that uh, I've gone through three of these carrying handles. The first two, when I would tighten it down, it would strip out the screw and it wouldn't hold in place at all. By the time I got this one, I decided I'm not going to over torque it. I put some Loctite on, uh, got it down by hand, and now they're secure. So I'm just leaving them this way, but you do have a 1913 rail underneath here. You can see your uh, rear sight uh, windage adjustment, left and right. As you can see from the rear, we do have a Long range and a short range aperture, very similar to that of the, uh, the M16. As you can see, our, our, ring, our slip ring, or if you want to call it that, it's right here, which is basically just a mount for the handguards. You can see we do have openings in here for, uh, for heat. 
Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to remove the gas system. We're going to flip this around. And you're going to see we're going to push inward and rotate all the way around. Now we're going to rotate the gas plug and we're going to pull the whole mechanism right out. Now to disassemble the operating rod assembly, you push in, rotate, lift out. As we have here, we have the gas cylinder, the piston, operating rod, operating rod spring, an additional spring, and a guide. Now, one thing very, very interesting about this, if you look at this articulating end here, if you were to take a look at the Colt LE6940P, one of the things that it sports as being unique about it is a articulating link. Well, that appears on the you know, 2000 era T91. Uh, this may have been on the original rifles too, but unfortunately I've never seen one of those come apart uh, on the earlier ones, so I can't say for sure. But you can certainly see that uh, it's just very strange. This is very similar to what Colt did. And as you can see, everything is totally internal. Due to the fact the gas is regulated through the cylinder here, uh, the gas port erosion with that, with that increase of gas that that lets in is not going to make a difference because this is where it's going to be measured from. So what that does is it keeps the uh, cyclic rate consistent over the life cycle of the barrel, which makes it more durable, more reliable, makes it last longer. Now for reassembly, you slide on recoil spring first, an auxiliary spring, and guide. I'm going to insert the gas cylinder. Push that back in, this in like this. And of course, you got to line uh, everything up in here. But once we have this in, we're going to push in. We're going to rotate that full 360. Then we're going to push this lever back in and rotate. Now, if you notice, we have a sling swivel. We have a bayonet lug, and we also have a bottom 1913 rail on here for mounting a bayonet, drilled and pinned in place. So for reassembly, we insert the charging handle like so, bolt carrier group, And there you go. Now we're going to talk about where all these parts came from. Uh, a couple of years back, uh, Wolf, Wolf Performance Ammunition, got in touch with the two, uh, Taiwan Sewell Fifth Arsenal about importing upper receivers of the T91 series. And the only problem with that was ATF would not allow the whole upper receiver with the barrel because the barrel is considered restrictive. Uh, you know, it's you know it's implement of war and so forth. However, ATF would allow them to bring in the unfinished blanks. Uh, so once they would get to Wolf Performance Ammunition. Uh, they would go ahead and, uh, and, cut, and cut them down with the CNC machine, uh, contour, and nitride finished them. Now, the original the original ones have a Type 86 front sight base. This is not. This is a T91. And we're going to talk about that in a second, too. Now, the upper receivers that came in are, were called the Wolf A1. Uh, they, were, they were had in 16 inches. They were had in 14.5 and 12. This is a 14.5 that you see here. And what we did was, this is the issue... Uh, muzzle device, which is again, this is a combination of flash hider as well as a muzzle brake. This was drilled and pinned in place, so now we're well over 16 inches, so it's legal. This again, this upper receiver came in as a Wolf 14 and a half inch. That was modified. Also, this was changed out. The original one, uh, you did not ha have the remove the movable uh, sling swivel. It was attached to the to the lever, which lever is not really a good idea because you're you're pushing on the uh, pulling on the sling. If that got caught, you could un you could loosen your lever up. And the ones that were imported also did not have the bayonet lug here, nor the 1913 rail. So what we did was, uh, well, actually I had uh, William. William, he got the parts. He sent it over to a friend of his who was a gunsmith. And he pulled the, the original front sight uh, block off, inserted the new one, drilled and tapped it, pinned it. Then he went ahead and uh, drilled and pinned the, the flash hider uh, in, in place. So now we have an upper receiver that is exactly a T91. Same barrel length, same everything. These are the original Wolf handguards. This originally didn't come with a carrying handle or any kind of a rear sight itself. It came with the front sight base, 
but it did not come with any kind of a rear backup sight. Went to T91 Tactical. Now, T91 Tactical is the place for all T91 parts. And all the parts pretty much that you see here all came out of T91 Tactical. And I chose to go with the carry handle. Uh, I, I decided I wanted this one to be just a standard run-of-the-mill infantry rifle, uh, which had the iron sights on it. Uh, I had no intention of putting any optics on here, so I stayed with this. Now, there's also a rear backup sight that's just the sight, no carrying handle. Uh, so you could get those as well through T91 Tactical. Uh, came with a bolt carrier group, as you see here. Came with the charging handle. Now, uh, one of the things I did to the left side was the Wolf has a Wolf A1 on the side, and it has a, a circle with a 556. Five, I got out some some black anodizing, um, you know, anodizing touch up and blacking that right out so you so it wouldn't be seen. Now is the lower receiver. There's a couple different places to get these lower receivers. Um, first off, you can get a 80% lower receiver from T91 Tactical that already has the, the markings inscribed into it, and you would take that and you would go and you would get, you, would, you would finish it yourself. This particular uh, lower receiver here came from Monty Leclerc uh, out of Centurion Arms. Uh, he sent the he sent the lower receiver, and when he did is he recontoured it so it would be an A1 because this is an A1 type lower receiver, not an A2. He recontoured it so it was uh, an A1, and then I sent this lower receiver off to John Brace. Now John Brace works in roll marks like Picasso works with oils. He does the probably the the best roll marks I've ever seen. They're not necessarily roll marks; they're they're engraving. They're not laser. Laser just doesn't look right. These rifles were always roll stamped. So you want something that's going to look right. So uh, he went ahead and he did the, the all the markings that were on it. Uh, then when I got it back here in Texas, it went to an anodizer. And now it's what you see here. For as far as lower receiver parts kits, the lower receiver parts kit uh, came out of T91 Tactical, as well as the pistol grip, as well as the receiver extension and the stock and the sling. Those all came out of T91. So in the end, everything on here is... Taiwanese, with the exception of the lower receiver and the semi-automatic only fire control part group. Everything else that you see here is 100% Taiwan military issue. And this is an extremely fun rifle. You know, it's a it's a good hammer forge barrel. It's going to last. This is not going to be a safe queen for me. Um, I've already got over a thousand rounds out of this rifle. I haven't had it that long. Um, I've really been enjoying shooting this thing. This thing has been 100% reliable with all the ammunition that's been put through it, which has been mostly Black Hills. Uh, ammunition and it's a uh, 55 grain full metal jacket. Now this is a one and seven inch twist, so I can put any kind of uh, ammunition that, that I want. Recoil impulse is 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 nice. I, I can't say that it's any more or less than uh, any 556. Five, uh, so far, out of a thousand rounds, I haven't really seen any damage inside the receiver extension. But as you saw, there, there was a, a bevel to the uh, to the rear of the bolt carrier, which I'm sure they thought of, and I'm also sure they've been testing these things for years to make sure that wasn't a problem. So what you're looking at here is a combination of the wolf upper receiver. Now you could get the standard wolf upper receiver and leave it. Leave it. Um, you know, just like you know myself and you know William was the same way. We wanted the most realistic clone that we could possibly do. And uh, you know William, he put it all together for as far as this upper receiver. And I, I certainly really couldn't be happier with it. A lot of you guys are going to say, "Oh, this is a piece of junk. It's Taiwanese. You know, it's it's not like any HK or anything like that." Well, you know what? This has been in service an awful long time by a lot of different countries. You know, when it was tested in Jordan, it was found by the Jordanians to be equal to the equal to or better uh, than the AK in reliability in the desert, and it makes a lot of sense to be, to the, you know, the way you have the operating system, which is completely in, in encased in steel, uh, so nothing can get into it. You know, this it's it's very well made to work in a sandy environment. Now, I did test it with a couple different kinds of ammunition. Uh, I had Black Hills ammunition out of this barrel. The 55 grain full metal jacket uh, had an average velocity of 2,831 feet per second. And Remington uh, UMC223 55 grain full metal jacket was 2,872 feet per second. I don't have any targets for this one because uh, for the most part I just shot at 25 yards. And I just shoot at some steel at 100 uh, with, without a problem. But, you know, uh, my eyesight's not all that great for as far as getting precision groups with iron sights. So I didn't really bother with any kind of uh, targets for this one, but uh, 25 yards, they were, you know, it was, you know, well respectable for somebody with my eyesight. What we're going to do now is go to the range. We're going to see how this thing shoots.
as I as I said, uh, this this rifle has been a lot of fun. You know, uh, it took it took me a good probably four or five months to build it. You know, as I said, we had to get all the parts, wait for certain parts to come in. Uh, you know, William, he had his his gunsmith, uh, you know, out there in Arkansas, you know, put everything together. Um, he did a freaking awesome job making sure it was you no know, scratches on it. It just it just looks really really nice. Um, you know, the only the only pain in the ass I really had was these the you know the carry handle for stars. The fact those screws were not hardened, so they would strip out. Um, but you know, the guy at T ninety one Tactical was awesome. You know, he took care of it every you know every single time. Uh, this time I just made sure I wasn't going to over torque it, and I just put some Loctite on it so it wouldn't come loose. Uh, you know, when I fired it the last time, it was prior to me using any Loctite, and the screws did come loose. The bolts did come loose. Uh, they're not going to do that again. But, you know, for any of you who want to buy the Wolf upper receivers, I do have a video on the Wolf A1 upper receivers already. So you can see some of the testing that was with the 16-inch. For somebody who's looking for an external piston option that's not too expensive, you're looking probably around $600 for the complete upper receiver, uh, minus the the carrying handle, and of course you're going to have the different front sight base. You're going to have more of the commercial type front sight base. It's a good, accurate, reliable, dependable upper receiver that, that Wolf's putting together. Um, the barrel is, is excellent. Uh, you know, again, you have a really good uh, cold hammer forge barrel. It's going to last a hell of a long time. Now, if you're seeing this on full 30, you'll see a list of all the links that we have here. Now, there are some additional companies you may have to look at for the shorter barrels. Um, there's not very many companies that, are, that carry the you know the SBR versions of this, uh, but there are. And uh, whether it's a short barrel, whether it's the 14 inch barrel, or it's the 16 inch barrel, you're going to have an excellent rifle. You're going to you're going to enjoy it. As I said, I'm having a, a blast with this thing. You know, I've got an HKMR556 here. I got a Sig uh, 516 here. I got a uh, a Caracal here. You know, I've got a lot, a lot of the major piston guns. I've got POF. Um, I've got some, you know, I got several of them, and you know those are more new. But if you really look at them, there's not much over this. Uh, there's not. This is just slimline and reliable. Uh, definitely, this is an awesome project. You know, you, you, these projects are fun because you know you want to you want to get the most realistic. So you go, you pay attention to every single detail. You know, I had uh, I had my buddy Henry here take a look at the Chinese ring to make sure that it was what it was supposed to say. You know, that's to, that's the degree before it was sent off to John Brace to do the engraving. I had a Chinaman look at it to make sure that it was written properly. You know, then, uh, you know, we have a you know, really good hand eyes here who can, in Texas who can do black. Uh, everything went together beautifully. But so many fine details on here, like, again, making this an M16A1 lower receiver because they don't use A2. This is all uh, original uh, from, from going back to 1965. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Uh, I certainly did enjoy building this rifle and taking it out and, sh and shooting it. And I'm going to be shooting this thing quite a bit. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better share. And please consider being a contributor on Patreon.